Can we go there next week again? Will you be as happy as you were the first time? Why? Happiness is not a real goal. What makes you happy now won't make you happy a few moments from now. You see what makes you happy right now? You, you, you die to get something right now, but the minute you get it, you want something else. In other words, if I want to bring it into perspective to you, is that happiness is a moving target. Happiness is not something that you are supposed to orient your, all your life to. You can't put your pursuits on one thing that is happiness. What kind of effort do you put in to be happy? Especially with the young minds in this room, we have all the energies, but to be happy, you, you, you don't need to do anything. Some of you are happy without going to class. Not going to class makes you happy. And you call that a goal? Were you born to do nothing? Because doing nothing obviously makes us happy. If no one is telling you what to do, that makes you happy. So if I'm in my free time and no one is telling me what to do, so I'm under no pressure, I am happy, and so that is going to be my pursuit in life, then human beings are oriented to, to pursue higher goals, happiness of which is not. So it means if we, are, we, we want to be people of high ideals, at least we are not supposed to focus on happiness of our own. And as I'm going, this happiness is number one. Remember we said five in trash, six, seven, eight, somehow okay. But number one of them, as I climb the ladder up, majority of the people are, are down. So many people on earth, eight billion people on the face of the earth, majority of them pursue happiness. And that is why right now we have a lot of people, motivational speakers, online, everywhere, they're calling you to be happy. Do what you want to be happy. Is that really why you were created? Is that a real goal? Do what you want. Some of us don't want to do anything. Actually, I'm happy doing nothing. But is that, some, is that supposed to be something I find pride in, that I'm, I'm happily doing nothing? The Quran doesn't teach us that. We are people of high ideals. So number one is happiness. That is something everyone pursues. And we don't expect someone who's oriented to serving the religion of Allah to be orienting their priorities, their pride into pursuing happiness. Actually, everything we are enjoying today is because someone lost their comfort. Is because someone was not happy at a moment in time. See this microphone? It is a result of someone's discomfort because they were speaking and no one was listening to them. So they decided to devise means with which they are going to be heard. The comfortable seat you're sitting in was as a result of not being happy with whatever they were sitting on. You having sights on the latest iPhone, the latest Samsung, is because you are not happy with the Samsung you're holding, the iPhone you're holding right now. Developments are occurring in the world today because someone somewhere is not happy with what they are having. So, reorienting our priorities from just wanting to be happy. Actually, there is some beauty in not being happy. There is some beauty in not being comfortable. See, there is an argument that Africa is arguably the, the most backward continent because of the comfort we have. Why would we have thoughts of building an air conditioner with a beautiful climate? Why? Why would, be think, why would we be thinking of coming up with a refrigerator, yet we have pots at home? Because of the beauty and the comfort we have, yeah, everyone else, everything here is not from an African mind. It is from someone who was not comfortable, someone who was not happy. And look at the majority of the people today, the, they're investing millions and millions because they want to be happy. And guess what? They will never be happy. Because the moment they get something they think is going to make them happy, they're going to orient their targets to something else they think will make them happy. If it is iPhone 14 that makes you happy right now, iPhone 15 will in the coming months. If it is something you, if it is a new dress you are dying to have right now, the moment you get it, there is something else that holds your happiness. In other words, happiness is not a real goal, and that can't be something Allah put me here on earth to do, to, mo to chase something that I can't achieve. Who has ever pursued happiness and they got it? They got it. None of them. 
Even the people you think, because we are deluded, we are deceived by the content we take in online, to, for people to make us think they are really happy. Not until you find out later on that people are really dying behind the scenes and they're putting bright smiles outside online. And they're confusing you to orient your priorities to pursuing happiness. Majority of the people pursue happiness. That is number one. But there are some people who pursue even higher. Happiness is a lower goal for them. There is a higher pursuit than happiness. And these people pursue fitting in. Let me call it social acceptability. They want to be accepted by society. They don't want to be the odd man out. They don't want to be the black sheep. And these are the people who worship the trend. Pursuing happiness is such a low goal that I don't need anyone else to be happy. It's just about myself. And on top of that, when, whenever I'm not happy, I'm always pointing at someone else. I'm not happy because of the weather. I'm not happy because so-and-so has annoyed me. I'm not happy because I didn't get as much food as I wanted. I'm not happy because I was caring for being late. You are always talking about someone else for you not being happy. But there are people who pursue higher. Even when the goal is so low, they pursue social acceptability. They want to be taken in by society. You look at the way you're dressing right now. Look at the way you talk, the way you articulate words, the way you even move, the way you even walk is influenced by someone else. And majority of us are like that. That you take in some, look at the style you trim your hair. Look at the style you braid your hair if you're a lady. We are always influenced by someone and all of a sudden there is a stereotype that we are really free. Are we really free when even the style of hair I trim is influenced by someone else? Is that what I call freedom? Is it really freedom when I'm someone who bends down and bows down to whatever society brings my way? You see there is this kind of uh, there are certain shoes, they are called, uh, I call them nigina. What do you call them? They are good, good shoes, imbu. You know them, those ones, crocs. They are called crocs. I reached a point of seeing everyone putting on these shoes. And I was wondering, these were shoes as we were growing up. These were the cheapest shoes someone could, could put on. So cheap. Do you have some 2,000 with yoga and often a nigi in Awali? And someone will be getting these, these very shoes. And how many years, just within no time, everyone is going back to the same shoes. And this was bothering me. Because something that, that was so lowly 10 years ago, how can it have so much pride that every youth is taking it up? So when I decided to ask one of uh, the people who we are delved into the shoes, they were like uh, a certain musician who shall not be named, uh, shot a video in USA putting them on. And people were following the trend of that musician. Some of you never knew that, but you are putting them on. Why? Because I have a friend who was putting them on. You are following society. And this is exactly something that was not praiseworthy even at the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Because whenever they would be told to worship Allah, what would they be saying? We are on the way of our forefathers. We are following the trend of our forefathers. We are, we are not willing to change. Wherever our forefathers were taking us, we are willing to go. So as a Muslim, society is going to be there. Society is going to create influence onto you. But as someone who pursues higher goals, that is not supposed to be your goal. Let society have their own trends, but you as a Muslim, you are someone who, who is supposed to influence society. Wherever a Muslim is, they influence society, but society doesn't influence Muslims. True Muslims in the history, when you talk of Ibrahim alayhi salam, surrounded by idol worshippers, did he bow down to society to worship idols like they did? Did he? When you look at Yusuf alayhi salam, Surrounded by people who wanted to seduce him. Surrounded by people who were seductive in all kinds of ways. Did he bow down to what society was suggesting? These are architects of society. 
They impact society, they influence society, they don't allow society to influence them. Though there are, nu there are numerous people who pursue social acceptability, that for them they are willing to do everything to fit in. Does it mean for me to pull just my trouser a little down, such that my friends don't call me foolish? Does it need for me to put on a certain kind of shirt and dress, such that my friends don't call me outdated? Do I need to listen to a certain kind of music that, that my friends will not call me weird? All those are things that are affecting us. And there are some people who make this a goal in life, that they will never be the black sheep, the odd man out. There are people who even pursue higher. They don't just want social acceptability. They don't want to get influenced by society. They don't, just don't want to fit in, but they want to be at the top of the chart. So they pursue popularity. They just don't want to be fitting in ordinary people. They pursue fame. They want to be popular. And they, they would even do the weirdest things on earth for them to keep on top of the chart. It, it wouldn't take long for you to, see, to, to hear someone. It's very common here in our country. I'm sure you're not new to this. That an artist will want to make a hit, a hit song. So you know what they do? They'll get married. They'll get married to a fellow artist. So they'll make a hit song to resuscitate the fame that was dying. So after making the hit song, again the fame dies. After the fame dying, do you know what they do? The man goes and makes a hit song. The lady also makes a hit to resuscitate the fame that is dying. Because they always want to be at the top of the chart. They are victims. They are slaves of popularity. They die to be as popular as they can. They, don't want to, they just don't want to fit in. They want to be on top of... They want all their eyes, all your eyes on them. They want to be the center of attention wherever they are. Because they die to be popular. If they don't care what they do for them to be popular. It is also common in schools. They don't care what they do. Even when it means for them to be known as the seductive boys at school, they will do that for them to be popular. That is not supposed to be a Muslim. Even when it means for me to be known for having many boys at school, so long as it, it makes me popular, I'm going to do that. No, that's not a Muslim. You'll find people intentionally releasing their nudes because they want to keep up with the popularity. They still want to be the talk in society because they die to be popular. Is this what a Muslim is supposed to be pursuing? We say it from number one to five. Where, where are we supposed to dump them? Trash. Remind me, what is pursuit number one? Pursuit number two, social acceptability. Pursuit number three, fame. Popularity. There are people who pursue higher. They pursue prestige. You know, pre prestige, uh, You see, as young as we are, prestige might be the order of the day. And since majority of you are students, it would be known that some of you feel your parents coming to your schools with the type of car they have, with the type of motorcycle they have, they are destroying the reputation you've built at school. That's what you would be thinking. And you know what to tell your dad when they're taking you back to school on that motorcycle that, that is not so good looking? You tell them, dad, you leave me in town, I will reach school myself. Because when I reach school with this motorcycle that you bring me on, the reputation I've built at school is going to go down. So you rather leave me here. So the dad will be thinking, my son is sympathetic with me. They want me to focus on other things, yet you don't want to destroy your so-called prestige and reputation at school. And people can be drunk on wanting prestige. And it goes wild even to parents. That they don't want to marry their daughters to just anyone. They want to marry their daughter. Uh, oh, before I reach parents, the girls themselves sisters in a home simply because my elder sister got married to a, had a certain kind of function I don't want to drop the standards I don't want to drop the standards of our home I need to pursue higher maybe if you're grown up and your neighbor sets up a function of 50 million you're like 
Oh no, I won't make mine any less than 50 million. My neighbor can't make 50 and I make less than 50. I need to be higher. They need to know nange nange kuendii. And people can delve into that. They can get drunk with that to a point that they're even blinded with what they're actually supposed to be, be focusing on. And sometimes people attach prestige and reputation not to who they are, not to what they have really achieved in life, but with who they have met, with the kind of schools they have gone to. See, right now, someone might be a very disorganized personality, but when you talk to them, actually, they will tell you, I come from school X. You know school X? Very big school. So you need to attach reputation to me because I went to a reputable school. Because you, you yourself, you have nothing reliable for you to build on your reputation. Your reputation is with the school you went to. And you don't forget that in your introduction. When you're given a microphone to speak, uh, my name is uh, so and so. I come from, you know that school, the top school in the country? Yeah, that's where I'm from. Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah. Even when they are the last in class. They will take pride in the school they attend to. Sometimes it's not just about the school. It's about who you've met. Of, of recent, we hosted Mufti Meng. But uh, I, I think that was not the first time he came in the country. He had come much before. So I saw people dying to have a selfie with Mufti Meng. A selfie. You know, that, that is something that is good that you bring out, I'm, I'm having this personality. But I would argue, some people took those selfies so that when you're having a religious argument out there, they take out the phone and say, Go kaya nyomu mani. I'm with Mufti Meng. Because you can't make a point on your own. You want to build your reputation, not with what you've achieved, but the school you went to, or sometimes the people you've met in life. Sometimes you, you brag, not because of who you are, but because of the people you know. And Muslims have not been people of people they know. Muslims have stood out wherever they are. They are the point of influence. They are the source themselves. Everyone holds tight onto them. They don't cling on other people for them to stand out in a community. And we need to put that in mind. That is pursuit number that's, that was pursuit number? Pursuit number four. We have pursuit number five. Money. Wealth. These people who pursue wealth, who pursue money, are geniuses. Big brains. They don't care how they look. They don't care about fitting in society or not. They don't care what kind of dresses they put on. You'll find them in a short on a Monday with sandals in town because they don't mind what you're going to speak about them so long as they're making millions of money. They will appear weird in front of everyone and then they're making millions of money every hour. Their mind is oriented to be entrepreneur. They're they are thinking of how are they making money day in, day out. And these are people who are going to have the weirdest kind of families. Because they don't have stable families because, and all their minds are focused on how am I making more money. Allah talks about them and he says, Yahsabu annamalahu akhladahu. He even reaches a point of even thinking that his money is going to make him eternal. You see, we are not so rich, but the moment you get a katenke, you feel like opening up a charity organization. You feel like you want to help everyone at school. You feel like what can take me out really with the money I am having? You can be drunkard on wealth that way. And I'm sorry to bring this as bad news to you, but number one to number five, like I told you, the Quran doesn't consider them as real goals. And woe unto a person who pursues any of those, who makes any of those as a core concept in their life. But at this moment in time, in the limited time I am having right now, allow me to talk to you about the last three pursuits that number six is the bare minimum 
any Muslim is expected to be pursuing. And that is something called excellence. Excellence, you can call it ihsan, you can call it itqan. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Inna allaha yuhibbul abda idha amila amalan ayyutqinahu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a slave who does everything with excellence. Anything they do. And we said with number six, what happens? When you pursue number six, what happens? Pardon? You may get all the five. You see the things we said are in trash? You may get them once you pursue number six. People who pursue excellence do not compete with anyone else. People who pursue excellence compete with themselves. This is the bare minimum required of a Muslim. We expect a Muslim, at the very least, to be competing with themselves. How better I am today than I was yesterday. This is excellence. You are supposed to be extending boundaries of your own excellence each and every day. And this is what we are called forward to do as Muslims. Excellence. I was in class with a classmate. I had a classmate. Very brilliant. And this was the hardest course in this program very difficult course and for you to get a 60 you would you'd gone perform umrah to thank allah for passing this this paper so after getting i think it was 72 that is nice enough i, I even want to perform a shukru for passing this paper my friend brilliant mind gets an 83 that is an a he has already passed. But he's like, no. I was badly marked. I was supposed to get 95. And I'm like, subhanallah, look at this person. I'm getting 70. I'm, I want to go and perform umrah and make a shukru to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for scoring this because this paper is not passable. You're scoring an 85, an 83, and you're saying it was... I actually, I actually realized it was not about him. It was about me. Because he was engineered differently. It is not that he, he, he is contented with the 83. He looks at himself, I can do better than 83. Me, I think I'm comparing myself to him. I have a 70, I, you have an 80. You're supposed to be grateful. He's not looking at me. He's looking at himself. Excellence is his thing. And we are going to call them weird. And we have these, these kind of people in every class. They are there. Even when they get a 99. They are not settled. They are even more worried than someone who failed. What am I going to tell my mother? I got a 99. Because they, they, they are competing with their own selves. You see, when you are in a race with someone who pursues excellence, you see, we are in Makerere, but if your goal is to reach Wandegeya, just up there, even when he is in Kajansi, even when the person following him is in Kajansi, they want to... You see, when I'm in Makerere and the, the finish line is in Wandegea, even when I decide to crawl, will someone in Kajansi reach the finishing line before me? Even when I decide to move like a baby, I'm going to reach Wandegea before they, they reach. But a person who pursues excellence is not going to crawl. They will even be faster because they are not competing with the one in Kajansi. They're not competing with anyone else, but they're competing with their own selves. They're extending boundaries of their own excellence. This is the bare minimum required of a Muslim. And I want to bring you examples from real life situations of people who are pursuing excellence and maybe they are getting all the things that I've talked to you about. How many of us know how to prepare chicken? Chicken. Deep fried chicken. Mashallah. Beautiful. Who knows you? How many of us know KFC? By show of hands. Do you know why you know them? This is an initiative from Kentucky. You know it in Makerere. Thousands of miles away. Not because you don't know how to prepare chicken, but because, oh my God, whatever they do, they do excellently. 
I swear, you rose up your hand, you, you, you want to prepare, you know how to prepare chicken, but if you were to prepare chicken and you put it here and KFC here, KFC will get done before you. And I'm not advertising KFC. But I'm trying to bring a point to you that excellence works. Okay. We said once you pursue number six, you might get all the five, right? Now let's analyze KFC. Let's analyze someone. Okay. Do you know I do you know people who have become filthy rich, who have built reputations in selling pancakes? There's a white van I keep on seeing around different spots in Kampala. Pancakes. Because they do what they do excellently. The world's best athletes, they do what they do excellently. They keep on extending boundaries of their own excellence. When you talk of the likes of Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo, there's always going to be a debate of who is the God, right? But one thing is there is going to be unanimous consensus about sportsmen that these two people are really great, right? You know why? Excellence is their thing. They really do what they do excellently. Hold on. Are these people, are these people wealthy? Are they wealthy in number five? Do they have a reputation? Do they have prestige in number four? Are they popular? Do they fit in? C could Lionel Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo come in here and you say, you are not fit to be in this society, please move out? Can we tell him that? Actually, we feel we are indebted for him to be here. We would actually tell him, don't sit there, sit here. And I'm being honest here. You wouldn't allow him to sit there. You tell him to sit here. Because he fits in, every society is going to, fit, to be in. The only question we would have about them is whether they are happy with their life. That is the only question we would have because happiness is something they can only tell on their own. But remember we said if you pursue number six, if you are excellent at what you do, regardless of what, right now maybe you are growing up and you still have influence from maybe your teachers, your parents, they are orienting you to one thing. You, want, you, have, you have to be a doctor, you have to be an engineer, you have to be a lawyer, top high profile professions. Truth is, you're not all going to be that. Some of us here are going to be taxi drivers. Some of us here are going to be waiters and waitresses. Some of us here are going to be border border riders. Some of us here are going to be chefs. We are going to prepare chapatis and sell to people. But the concern is, regardless of what you do, Allah likes it when you do whatever you do excellently. When you have itqan in whatever you do, when you have precision in whatever you are doing, Maybe, like I told you, Allah will open for you doors for other things. Let yourself be the best shoe shiner in town. That whoever thinks of shining their shoes, they're going to visit your shop. Be the best person who fries chapati around. Like you fry chicken like no one else does that. Be the person who plays netball at school that everyone is like, oh wow, I want to be like them. They're excellent at what they do. Everything you touch, you are excellent. And these are the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected. People of excellence who are good at whatever they did. Businessman like Uthman. Businessman like Abdurrahman bin Auf. None of the businessmen could touch them. One story about Abdurrahman bin Auf that when he came to Islam and they were now migrating to Medina, the elite people in Makkah, in the Makkah society told him, you're free to go to Makkah, to go to Medina with your Islam. He was not so much persecuted because he was rich, filthy rich. And the, the elite people in Makkah told him, you can go to Medina, but you are not moving with a single penny. You're leaving all your wealth here. You know why? You're not going to drop the economy of Makkah simply because you've become Muslim. He was a man who was filthy rich, that if he was to move with his wealth, the economy of Mecca would go down. So they told him, the only way we are going to persecute you, leave all your wealth. And yes, these are the people that we are surrounded by, the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. They surrounded him, people of excellence. And this is the bare minimum you are supposed to be pursuing. 
the people who pursue higher. Because excellence is just about me. Like I told you, I am competing with my own self. It is a goal that doesn't go beyond me. I'm only thinking about myself. There are people who even pursue higher. These are the people who pursue impact. How are they impacting society? How are they improving the society they are living in? I just don't want to be an engineer. I want to be an engineer who wants to impact society, to help society. I just don't want to be a doctor. I don't just want to be a medical personnel. I want to be that profession who helps people, who creates impact to people. And this is what the Prophet Muhammad wasallam was. If you're a person who pursues impact with no doubt, like I told you, all the rest are going to be laid ahead of you because you are someone pursuing impact did the prophet want to impact us sallallahu alaihi wasallam did he want to impact us yes yes he wanted to impact us how beautiful is when he was visiting this graveyard and he said oh how i wish i met my brothers companions are like hold on ya rasulullah Aren't we your brothers? Have you forgotten Badr? Remember Uhud? We are fighting by your side. Aren't we your brothers? Then the Prophet says, Antum ashabi. You're just my companions. You are a people I share a time and place with. But as of my brothers, they are the people who are going to come much after me and they are going to find my name written in scriptures. They are going to find people telling them there is a man called Muhammad who spread this message of Islam and they will follow me without them seeing me. Those are my brothers. You were in the, in the head of the Prophet Muhammad You were in the thoughts of the Prophet Muhammad He wanted to impact you even without seeing you. And yes, because of his pursuit, his message reached thousands of miles far away than he was and it reached thousands of languages, millions of languages that he himself couldn't speak at the time. It is because he died, he wanted to pursue the impact he puts in, in other people. And this could be seen from a macro perspective, but also to a micro perspective. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam was oriented to creating impact. How would it appease you that the Prophet Muhammad wasallam used to move around Medina with a five-year-old girl holding his two fingers? And they are moving around Medina. What is he creating? Do you think that young girl is going to forget this moment with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Do you think a Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam who is in prayer, his grandchild comes and jumps over his back as he is in sujood and he prolongs the sujood? Abu Huraira says, I lifted my head up to see whether, what happened to the Prophet. The sujood has been long. Did the Prophet die in prayer? Only to find that there is a child at the back of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He doesn't want to disturb the child what is the prophet creating impact on a macro stage and on a micro micro stage when he was toned when he was pelted he in blood soaked shoes on his way from taif the angel responsible for mountains reaches him and is like just give me one word and i take out taif what does he say does he say put them out he said forgive them for on their backs might come people who believe in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a mindset of someone of impact. He wants to impact people. I just don't want to see it barehanded in my town. Uh, the only talk I have is that I'm an engineer. I am a doctor. I am a teacher. And you create no impact on society. No one knows you for something. You are just idle. You impact no society. You don't impact your own siblings at home. Then what kind of personality are you? Whose sunnah are you following? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu was a man of impact. And yes, he impacted you. Eight, two billion Muslims on the face of the earth. All impacted by one man who never went to school. Remember what I told you. It is not about where you studied. It is not about what religion you follow. It is not about your race, your tribe. Or the region you come from. And yes, I'm talking about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But to bring it closer to you, we have honorable people who are not Muslims. Who are not, when you talk of Nelson Mandela, he died to impact a people of Africa. 
Where did he live? South Africa. Hundreds of miles away from us. But this man died to see that racism goes to the law in Africa. Look, our national stadium here is called Mandela National Stadium. After him. Man who lived far away, he's creating impact even here. These are people of impact. Even though you would argue they are fate in the hereafter, but they have created impact to us. And they are notable wherever they are. When you talk of the likes of Malcolm X, the people who, they are people who have created impact. And this is something required of a Muslim. If you can't impact people on a macro, if you can't impact the people because you're the head boy, you're the head girl, you can impact your own neighbor in the dormitory. You can impact your neighbor at home. You see how the prophet teaches that to us? The best of you is the best of your family's micro impact. And then he, when he tells leaders to be lenient to their followers, when he tells you you are going to be questionable to the people that you lead, he's teaching you macro impact. This is something we are supposed to instill in ourselves. You have a ratio of impact you can put on your neighbor. The one you share the bench with. The one you share a dormitory with. The one you share a class with. You have a ratio of impact you can put into them. You are supposed to stand out. Some of us are coming from societies that are not Islamic. We are coming from societies and we are the minority in those societies. How about we think of impacting them? How about we think of being the people who stand out, that even when these people are not going to accept our religion, these people accept that we are a group of people safe to stay with, because we are a people of impact. Wherever a Muslim stands, a Muslim is going to stand out, because he impacts society wherever he goes. That is pursuit number seven. There are people who pursue even higher. Higher than just impact. They pursue the truth. They pursue what? Truth. And uh, let me tell you the lowest something about truth, the moderate truth, and the ultimate truth. Just three examples of layers of truth. The lowest of which, speak the truth wherever you are. Be a person of truth. Put lies out of you. That is the bare minimum you can do if you want to pursue the truth. Speak the truth. Put lies out of your life. Because every bad habit has something to do with lying. A married man who cheats, what will they say to the wife? I have a business trip. Did they lie? Yes. A student who wants to dodge class, what do they tell the teacher who finds them in the dormitory? I am sick. Did they lie? Yes. Anyone who wants to get money from their parents falsely, what do they say? They want a book of photosynthesis. Did they lie? Yes. Every bad vice has something to do with lying. So if I want to be a person of high ideals for the bare minimum, let me be a person of truth, a person who speaks the truth. Then something in the middle, something moderate about truth is knowledge because there is a lot of truth embedded in knowledge that is why people who pursued knowledge people who pursue knowledge are people of high ideals they're people of high goals because they are thinking far and rich they're not th they're not having their sights about what they're going to have for dinner their sights are with what do i know more than what i know right now and ultimately, the people who know more are the people who create impact. And as you create impact, you become excellent at what you do. And once you become excellent at what you do, the five that we dropped in the trash will come flowing to you. Didn't the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, receive an offer to have a mountain of gold? Didn't he? Did he choose to take it? He chose not to. It is because all these things were being brought, all the five things were being brought to his disposal, and he was not accepting any of them. Some people would even confuse him. Abu Bakr was slightly richer than the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So sometimes his clothing was somehow better than the clothing of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And some people would be like, Ya Rasulallah, because 
you know, the prophet didn't live at a time of social media that his face would be known everywhere. They would just hear the name Muhammad, Muhammad, Rasulullah, Rasulullah. So sometimes when he would move with Abu Bakr, they would attribute their attention to Abu Bakr because his clothes were slightly more expensive. And they're like, yeah, Rasulullah and Abu Bakr would be like wrong address. This is Rasulullah. It is because not even himself, he was not a person who, who wanted to attract attention to himself. He was not someone pursuing popularity, not someone pursuing to fit in. He doesn't want to fit in your society. He has higher ideals. So when you pursue knowledge, you are creating more opportunities for yourself to create more impact. Because look at the advancements we have in the world today. How far the world has moved, how far has the world been impacted by virtue of people who have attained more knowledge. So if you want to impact the society more, you require the, you need the requirement of knowledge. So knowledge is there. And the ultimate truth is the pleasure of Allah. Pursuing the pleasure of Allah. You see, when, when you make the pleasure of Allah your ultimate aim, it is irrelevant whether other people are pleased or not. Actually, it becomes difficult for those people not to be pleased. Because when Allah is pleased with you, he calls Jibril. He tells him, I love so and so, so I'm commanding you to love him. Jibril moves to the assembly of the angels. He tells them, Allah loves so and so. And so, I love him and I'm commanding you to love him. Then angels, angels come flooding on earth. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, فَيُوضَعُ لَهُ الْقَبُولِ Allah gives acceptance to him. People are going to like him because the chain begins with Allah liking him, Allah being pleased with what you're doing. It is irrespective of whether people uh, believe you or not. It is irrespective of whether people accept you or not. The Prophet was not bothered by whether the people are following him or not. He is not bothered whether the minority are the Muslims and the majority are non-Muslims. He's chasing one goal, the pleasure of Allah. And ultimately, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, will ever be the best human being to ever set foot on earth because he was a person, a, passion, a person of high ideals and high goals. He pursued truth, ultimately the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last bit I want to put out here, I've talked about pursuit of all those things. The last two things. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, like I've told you in, in the ayah, we inna sa'yakum la shatta. Your pursuits are different. You pursue things right, left, and center. You pursue things from happiness to impact. You pursue things from happiness to the truth. But, I want you to follow with me. When it comes to someone who a'ata, he gives out, then wataka, then he becomes God conscious. These are two things that Allah is pointing out for any Muslim to be in line with. Giving, and when you give, you are creating impact. You're helping someone else be better. A'ata, wataka, and the same time you're trying to be God conscious. And being God conscious is a piece of truth you are chasing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala combines truth and impact in a'ata, wataka. Wasaddaqa bil husna, and they, they have conviction. They have their hopes. They truly know that there is al-husna, the ultimate reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Listen to what Allah says about such people. فَسَنُيَسِّرُهُ لِلْيُسْرَى We shall make the easy, easy for them. You see things that are taking up people's minds? People are dying day and night to, to look for money. People are dying day and night to look for fame. People are dying day and night to look for happiness, popularity, fame, prestige, and wealth. But Allah is saying all that is easy. And even when it is easy, yusra. We shall make the easy, easy for him. And as for the one who becomes stingy, he withholds. He does not give out. In other words, he is stopping to create impact. He is withholding the impact he can create with someone. Bakhila was tagna and he thought he is on his own. 
he thought he is sufficient he needs no one fasanu yasiruhu lil usra we shall make his path to difficulty easy see what allah is saying even you see people who put all their attention to wealth are the people who have the miserable lives so allah is saying when you put all your attention to things to lowly goals as a human being then you are going to become a servant of those lowly goals but when you put your ultimate goals to be so lofty that you are pursuing allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you pursuing to create impact in societies you are the people allah is going to make the easy easy for otherwise we are going to be people who are made whose path to difficulty is made easy that's what allah is saying fasanu yassiruhu lil usra the very last point i want to put out is that i've been talking about pursuit 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 and that is the most important thing when it comes to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pursuit it's not whether you've created impact or not it is have you pursued impact are you putting in effort to create impact this is the most important thing you see human beings are result oriented you see when you are when you fail a test you don't explain to your teacher how hard you read not so even when you spent the whole night reading you don't tell your teacher or oh, you, you are supposed to give me marks because i read hard i read hard for this test when you're going for a job interview you don't explain how hard you read you don't explain how hard you work to earn this degree no all human beings are looked are looking into how are the results did you pass or not that is all human beings are are looking at none of them looks at the effort and allah is so just that part of his justice is that when he is going to reward someone he is basing on the effort not the result allah is not looking at the result you're putting on table allah is looking at the effort that is behind whatever you are doing does it did come to you that the prophet nuh alayhi salam after calling people to allah for 950 years 950 years a millennium but 50 would expect okay now that is a good chance for you to call more people to allah that we want you now to be having enormous rewards enormous results how many people did he receive nuh alayhi salam largest of which is mentioned in the books of history is 82 followers 82 followers nuh alayhi salam after 950 years if we were to make a progressive report for nuh alayhi salam he would be a failure that is f9 you failed your assignment but you know what allah does allah is not looking at how many people have come to follow you there are prophets who are standing in front of allah with no followers but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting them in the same level of jannah like the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam not because they have the same results but they share the same effort and they are called ulul azmi min ar-rusul they are people of great they are prophets so messengers of great commitment when it comes to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they share the effort we are seated here today we've come to this session to this setting to remind ourselves about allah but you know what beats my understanding allah is not rewarding us the same It is not that when we all come here we are receiving the same rewards there are some people who have left a lot they have sacrificed a lot of their wants for them to come and sit here there are some people who even when the convention wasn't here they they would be here they wouldn't be moved and it would be unfair for Allah to reward them the same and he says I'm not rewarding basing on result I am rewarding basing on effort So the most important thing about the pursuits I've laid out to you is the pursuit itself. It is the effort, not the result. No one sent you for results. You see when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says sabaqa dirhamun 100,000 dirham. Sometimes a dirham can supersede 100,000 dirhams. To put it to our perspective, 1,000 supersedes a million. The companions are like ya rasulullah how is that possible the prophet tells them this person who was given in a thousand might just have had two thousands and the person who was given in a million might just have had a billion and a million on a billion is just a pinch and look at the percentage of one thousand on two thousands i just gave out half of my wealth then how different is someone who gives in one thousand having two thousands from umar ibn al-khattab who donated half of his wealth 
at Tabuk. So when we are talking about someone receiving rewards with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basing on efforts, this is what we are talking about. Allah rewards effort. He does not reward results. He does not look at results. Otherwise, had he been looking at results, none of us would be on a high level. But there are people seated in this room that are in the same level of Jannah like companions. Not because they did the same things like the companions, but because the effort they put in to do those things are like the companions' efforts, even when the results did not come out for them. This is something we are supposed to be pursuing. When you're reading your books, students, read hard. Even when you're playing, play hard. Even when you're doing anything you touch, be a person of excellence. Minimally, when you pursue higher, pursue being a person of impact to societies. When you pursue higher, pursue divine pleasure. This is when you shall get ultimate success here on dunya and in the hereafter. May Allah suffice for us all. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته